The spirituals are primarily religious folk songs. They were birthed out of slavery. There were many different types of spirituals. They were used as praise songs. They were used um, as songs of communication. The text primarily were biblical text, and they chose biblical text because of the Israelites in the Old Testament who were also an enslaved people. And they believed that if the God of the Israelites could deliver them, that that same God could deliver them as well. Throughout the 1800s, African-American settlements dotted Columbus with names like Peter's Run, Oak Woods, and Mudsack. There are a number of small African-American settlements all around central Ohio. A lot of them seem to be located around the Olentangy River. Some have names and some don't. So you had pockets all over the city. And that's what's unique about Columbus, that you had 10, 12 different little hamlets of Afro-American communities. Unreliable census numbers don't give us the whole picture, but what is known is that the African-American population started to swell during the South's turbulent reconstruction years after the Civil War. The intense segregation, the fact that people literally couldn't even be comfortable walking downtown or shopping or even attending church in their home community. Then there were issues like the political disenfranchisement that people literally could not vote and the lack of economic opportunities. And then we look at issues like lynching. So people who did try to fight back within their community were literally killed for their efforts. And then later terrorist groups like the Ku Klux Klan, which is, after all, a terrorist group, helped to keep people in their place. So the refugees who are coming north then after Reconstruction will be African-Americans. The African-American migration from the South to the North really represents one of the greatest internal mass migrations in world history. When the migration came along, it came because people needed a sense of hope. They needed a sense of safety. We're talking over over six million people who literally voted with their feet, who literally said, we aren't gonna stay where we are because we know that there's some place better we can be. As African Americans began to migrate north, they were coming north because the north was the promised land. You'd often heard in the spirituals, they talked about getting to the promised land. They leave at the rate of 500 a day and 15,000 a month. And so by the time the 1930 has come, one third of Alabama's black population is living north already. And that's just Alabama. It really is more, I'm, I'm seeking freedom, I'm seeking economic ability, I'm seeking a safety, very much like the refugees we see today. We were Americans. We still are Americans. This is our country. We fled within our own country. That's unbelievable. While Jim Crow laws pushed, the promise of steady work pulled. And they could move from a, a working class to a middle class status within a lifetime. That was unique and almost unheard of for many Southern communities. And so part of the pull factor facilitating that was the role of the unions. And they had what were called the labor agents who went through various communities in the South advising people of particular economic opportunities, the cities they should go to, and the communities where they could live. My father came from Tennessee. The only way he escaped Tennessee, he couldn't go beyond the seventh grade because they wouldn't let you get an education beyond there, was join the military. From the military, he got to Ohio. That's the only way he got out of Tennessee. 
the African-American settlements swelled in population, civic groups and churches responded by locating housing and health care for the new arrivals. It's a part of our DNA that when we moved to communities, it was a community. We cared for one another. We looked after one another. Over the years, settlements came and went with little evidence that they ever existed. Some come to us in photographs, others are gone. The settlements are still a part of the fiber of the city. They all served a purpose. Once that purpose faded, when industry moved or circumstances, then we've lost those. Like, there's no sense that there was ever an Afro-American community in Hilliard. People moved, moved on. But one settlement survived and thrived. The Near East Side becomes really probably the heart and soul of what we think of as the African American community. Because whether you're rich or you're poor, that's where you're going to live. And so it is. It's a city within a city. By the 1930s, parts of it will take the term Bronzeville. Some residents still refer to the King Lincoln District by Bronzeville, still remember its mayors and political power at City Hall, and still mourn the raising of the Blackberry Patch to make way for Poindexter Village and the social strife that followed. One pushback of the Great Migration came in the form of neighborhood covenants that restricted the sale of real estate to minorities to the Irish, the Italians, and African Americans. Uh, ads for, for, for houses for sale or for rent, they specified no color, okay? Meaning no African Americans. And so we know that there was redlining so that there were areas where African Americans could not purchase a home. The last thing you want to do in some people's minds is see them popping up in your neighborhood. And so there are restrictive covenants that come in that say you cannot sell to Italians, you cannot sell to African Americans, and that goes with the deed of your property. My dad had signed the papers because he was a very fair Afro-American, and by the time they had to get uh, signatures for my mom, it was too late, but they had not intended to sell to an Afro-American. The Great Migration lasted from 1910 to the 1970s, and the push and pull of immigrants both south to the north and east to the west left a unique settlement pattern different than other Midwestern cities. Columbus has never had a full-fledged ghetto, if you will, where the majority of African Americans resided as existed in Cleveland and to some extent in, in Cincinnati. Other historians have noted that one of the reasons why Columbus does not have the racial conflict at that time that others do is because at no part of the city are there more than 30% African American or any dominant ethnic group. And so because they're diffuse, it is not that armed racial conflict that you might be seeing in, in other places. I think the greatest impact of the great migration from the South to the North of African Americans is to open up more doors for education for black people. Education is the greatest building block to escape poverty, to escape racism, to build your own future. And the North gave us that opportunity. So the great migration made America stronger made the black race richer in deed and in thought, and gave this country an opportunity to be the melting pot that it is. <laughs>